Hello. Tonight, works written more than a century apart by two pianist composers. Mozart, the star performer, penning pieces to wow audiences at his own concerts. Ravel, using the piano as a composing tool to sketch out his massive orchestral vision. And we're certainly in good hands with the BBC Symphony Orchestra under the baton of Spanish conductor Joseph Conte. It's a concert of apparent contrast, the poised elegance of Mozart in the first half versus the sensory overload of Ravel in the second. But the true picture is a more complex and textured one, with a melancholy mood overtaking Mozart for at least the middle movement of his piano concerto number 23 in A major, and a structural discipline underpinning the Dionysian swoon of Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe. Mozart was 30 when he wrote this concerto. It was 1786. He'd moved to Vienna, the musical capital of the Western world, from Salzburg five years earlier to go freelance, no patron now. And he wrote to his father, this is very definitely the land of the piano. And Nicholas, all Mozart's last 17 piano concertos were written in Vienna, weren't they? That's right. He was certainly a busy boy during that period of time. And unfortunately, me as a left-handed pianist, Mozart concertos are completely off limits for me. But I absolutely adore his music. And they're still the real backbone of the concert pianist life today and Mozart really did put the concerto form on the map. And with this particular concerto Mozart's choice of keys contributes to its shifting emotional sounds. It's in A major which may have been down to no more than his use of the then still relatively new instrument the clarinet in A which has only been around for about 30 years and then there's this sister key of F sharp minor for the adagio a unique choice for Mozart. Nowhere else is it the home key for a movement across all his concertos. And there was this prevailing idea in the Baroque era, wasn't there, that composing in a particular key would inspire a particular mood in the listener. That's right. Even a contemporary of Mozart called Christian Schubert wrote about in a book saying the characteristics of different keys. He described A major saying this key includes declarations of innocent love, youthful cheerfulness and trust in God. He then goes on to describe F sharp minor of the second movement, a gloomy key. It tugs at passion as a dog biting a dress. Resentment and discontent are its language. I will have this image of the dog biting the dress as I listen to that movement. And there are other unusual things about the concerto too. One being that the cadenza near the end of the first movement was written out at the time of its composition. Why is that significant, Nicholas? Well, ordinarily, pianists use the cadenza as a time to show off their virtuosic wizardry at the piano. The cadenza for me is always a time I get quite nervous, actually, because it's a time where the orchestra stops and you're quite on your own showing off to the audience. And what's really special about this concerto is that Mozart is very specific as to what he wants the soloist to do here, and he writes it out in full. And there's a kind of theory about this. I've got a little copy of one of Mozart's manuscripts for the clarinet part of his concerto. It's a sketch of his student, Barbara Ployer. Um, she was the daughter of a tax collection in Vienna, and I love the way that her hair is apparently made up of little rests and, and quavers and things. And the idea, Nicholas, was that Mozart would have written out the cadenza for her as guidance. That's right. I mean, it could be that Mozart had an even higher profile as a teacher and a performer at the time he was, he was obviously composing. And we know that Barbara Ployer would have played this cadenza with flourishes that would be probably too much for us in the concert hall today. Well, tonight the concerto is being performed by a highly accomplished student of the piano, Argentinian-born Ingrid Fleeter, and I'm a huge fan of hers, but I've never heard her play this concerto live. I went to the BBC's Maidervale studios to watch her rehearse and have a proper pianist-to-pianist -pianist chat ahead of her first ever proms appearance. We have to never forget the reason why we do what we do. We are not going on stage to show off, to show that we can. Uh, we go on stage because we have a mission. <laughs> to communicate. To communicate music. Have you always loved Mozart? Or is it something that's grown on you over, over time as a performer and as a, as a music listener? I would say that it's a composer together with Chopin mm -hmm. that uh, was part of my education since I was uh, a very young age. And I, I think it was a great choice for my teachers to, to give me lots of Mozart and Chopin because they both relate in a way. They both have um, this classical soul and a romantic expression all mixed together. They, all de they both deal with beauty, with balance, with harmony. Um, the sound that you create in the, fr in, the, in the way you play a phrase, it's very important. So how to create a singing tone in the piano is one of the most difficult things to achieve because the piano naturally doesn't sing. So you create the illusion and for Mozart and for Chopin, for both composers, uh, it's important to imagine that you're a singer. When you look at a Mozart concerto or a Mozart solo piece, do you approach your technique differently? 
there is more space uh, in Chopin for for your body uh, participation. Mm. So y somehow the arm and the um, and the back and your stomach, everything participates in Chopin. In Mozart, it's much more um, like an arrow, no, um, that goes right into into the point. Yes. There's no space, f for my taste, uh, for playing around too much in, towards, in terms of sound. You can play with color mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, it is a sunny concerto, sunny Sunday day uh, concerto. Still, there is a veil that covers this happiness, so uh, my melancholy hidden underneath. And we confirmed this with the second movement, yes, the incredible F-sharp minor moment that uh, moves you deeply, it and really I, I cannot imagine one person that will not feel uh, touched and moved by it. I'm sure there won't be a dry eye in the house on <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> night. We will see, we will see. Nicholas was talking there to Ingrid Fleet, who at the rehearsal studios, and here she is coming on now to perform Mozart's piano concerto number 23 in A major with the BBC Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Joseph Pons.
Piano Concerto number 23, the final rondo with its invention of Bunda's energy sparkle and uplifting repost to the earlier sorrows. What did you think of Ingrid Fleeter's performance there with the BBC Symphony Orchestra conducted by Joseph Ponce? I thought her performance absolutely spellbinding and her clarity of her tone when she sang is absolutely fantastic. I noticed when she first plays, she does a kind of gesture with her hand as if she's almost stroking the keyboard and then seems to have quite relaxed and almost understated and yet what a mood change between the second and the third movement. What I loved about the third movement there was I remember when she said to me how she actually envisages the orchestra as members and, and characters of the opera because obviously this was composed at the same time as Mozart's monumental Marriage of Figaro. So Ingrid Fleeter can take a well-earned rest now and Nicholas and I will be turning our attention to the second half of tonight's concert with Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe. But before we immerse ourselves in nymphs and shepherds, here's a word from fellow presenter Katie Derham about her show tomorrow night. To Katie Derham. I'm going to be discussing the concert you're watching now and so much more on Proms Extra tomorrow evening. My guests on the sofa are the violinist Daniel Hope the singer Carolyn Sampson and the pianist Stephen Huff. And we're going to have a special performance by the Heath Quartet in the studio as well. So do join me tomorrow evening over on BBC Two at 8.15. Katie Durham there. And the second half of tonight's prom is just a few minutes away. Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe came towards the end of a 10 year period that was the most productive of the composer's working life. Music was absolutely flowing out of him, yet he struggled with Daphnis. It took three years to compose, from 1909 to 1912, and at the same time he was working on several other pieces, including his The Van for a Dead Princess and, by contrast, The Mother Goose Suite. Part of the reason for the difficult birth of Daphnis and Chloe could have been that it wasn't Ravel's own idea. It was commissioned by Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, and the choreography was by the great Russian dancer, Fokin, who had long dreamed of adapting the authentic Greek myth. Well, Ravel's reference point was the Greece of nostalgic 18th century French art. So to Fokin, it was essentially phony. And, and in the event, the ballet was kind of overshadowed, wasn't it? Sort of by the shock value. There's Debussy's La Prémidi d'un Faune, also rooted in Greek mythology, which premiered just 10 days earlier uh, with daring choreography by Nijinsky. And Stravinsky's earth-shattering Rite of Spring was to come the following year. That's right. And the Parisian premiere of Daphne and Chloe nearly derailed by a quarrel between Fokin and Diaghilev over Nijinsky. Diaghilev tried to retaliate by not giving the ballet enough rehearsal time and even threatened to 
cancel it. It was all very messy and, and very human. Well, at the time, Raphnis and Chloe got mixed reviews, uh, lacking the first quality of ballet music rhythm itself. And Stravinsky, on the other hand, saying not only is it Ravel's best work, but also one of the most beautiful products of all French music. And the orchestral score has stayed hugely popular. The music is so exquisite. And the scale of its orchestration, you see all those instruments done, it's immense. Um, in a way, it's almost surprising to me that there was ever a ballet to go with it. I know, it's amazing. It's stunning. And Ravel must have liked it too, as he called it a choreographic symphony and it really is incredibly musical it's structured like a symphony it's got a small number of recurring themes tableau textures and it's got a lot of layers that are beautifully interwoven and it really is a huge piece i mean ravel never got to write for an ensemble this big again and it's got harps the celeste 15 woodwind nine percussionists a wind machine and a wordless choir to boot and there's something about that scale of orchestration which i think matters it's almost filmic in this kind of widescreen sense um, you know, and there's this wordless choir singing. And if there's something kind of familiar about it, if you've seen any of those great Hollywood epic films of the 1930s and 40s, it's that kind of feel to their music because a lot of the composers of the generation after Ravel went to Hollywood and put this kind of orchestration skills into the scores they wrote there. Should we talk a bit about the storyline? Because um, it's based on Greco-Roman pastoral romance by Longus, and it was set this story before by other composers, um, Offenbach and I think Rousseau, and reflects kind of general musical preoccupation through the centuries uh, with Greek mythology. Well, the plot. Daphnis and Chloe are worshipping the nymphs. Daphnis and a rival called Dorkan have a dance-off to win a kiss from Chloe. Lycaon tries to seduce Daphnis. Chloe is carried off by pirates. Daphnis faints and is revived by nymphs and shepherds. And Chloe is re rescued from pirates by Pan and the lovers are reunited. And there's just general joyous dancing throughout the whole thing. Yeah. So basically, it's a nymph is nearly raped by pirates, the end. And as you can tell, I'm not big on the plot. Um, it's pretty dodgy. But the music, I've seen this at the proms before, it is something else.
rebels, Daphnis and Chloe. A rapturous end to what a bacchanal it was there. Performed by the BBC Symphony Orchestra and Chorus, the conductor, Joseph Pont. And sometimes I think, Nicholas, that more really is more. And I counted 200, I think, uh, singers and musicians down there, and it shows. It really is a whirlwind of a piece. It's absolutely amazing. And, and it must be so demanding for the orchestra to play as well. They seem to make it look so effortless in some parts and then, you know, so, so virtuosic in others. It was really, really wonderful. And just thinking of some of the complex orchestrations where you've got the dawn chorus coming up with the sunrise, all evoked on instruments and yet somehow so real. And that whirlpool of sound we got at the end there. But Ravel said he ripped it off from Rimsky Korsakov, Shahrazad. He said he put it on the piano and then just copied it. <laughs> Master Stephen Jackson, they're being embraced on stage by conductor Joseph Pons. But the sound of that wordless choir was such an integral part of the power of this piece. I think it really gave the, the sense of that, that mystery and that, that familiar sound that we have from, you know, Hollywood films and things, yet, yet was so mysterious at the same time. Time to go now, trailing clouds of glory and dancing to Pan's pipes as that brings tonight's prom to a close. Hopefully you've been as moved and uplifted by what you've heard as we have and as clearly the audience here at the Albert Hall have. You can catch up with performances and much more via the prom's website and BBC iPlayer, including an extra special performance from tonight's concert, the world premiere of the BBC prom's commissioned by Jonathan Dove, Guy Theory. Katie Durham will be hosting Prom Extra on BBC Two tomorrow night and I'll be back here on BBC Four this time next Friday with Susie Klein. When the programme includes more Rebel, that's very close to my heart, a core part of my own repertoire, it's his piano concerto for the left hand. Until then, good night. Good night.